Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome back to uh, the PNHP 2020 annual convention. Um, we have a lot of attendees already. We had many attendees yesterday. Um, if you're just joining today for the first time, um, um, welcome. Uh, and if you're coming back, thank you for, for returning. Um, I'm Adam Gaffney. For those of you who don't know me, I'm the president of Physicians for a National Health Program. Um, and I'm very excited um, to um, announce a really great agenda today that I think should be um, provocative and educational um, and give really um, give all of us a, an opportunity to think ahead about the next stage in the struggle for single payer Medicare for all. Um, so I'm going to introduce our first speakers um, and um, you get the we probably have um, more, more, some, some, um, a greater proportion of non-members this year on account of this being a um, uh, online um, conference. I'll say just a few more words about our first few speakers um, for, those of the, for those of you who may be um, unfamiliar. So um, David Himmelstein and Steffi Woolhandler uh, will be talking us through um, the health policy update that they do annually. Um, by way of background, um, David um, and Steffi, since uh, they met in 1979 in Oakland, have been working together um, to advance the cause of health equity access and universal health care and single payer in specific. Um, their research in the 1980s on patient dumping, um, the practice of pushing patients from a uh, who lacked health insurance into, into public hospitals um, helped uh, lead to the passage of MTALA that made that practice illegal. Their studies on medical bankruptcies um, that most bankruptcies uh, have a health related cause is probably one of the more ubiquitous um, uh, statistics you hear cited um, uh, in, in the healthcare reform debate. Um, their work on hospital and healthcare administrative costs um, helps us to understand today uh, why it is and how it is rather that national health insurance can achieve the savings we need in order to realize um, universal health coverage. And um, in the late 1980s, um, David and Steffi, and I think around 200 other doctors met in New Hampshire. Um, and out of that meeting, um, they co-founded uh, Physicians for a National Health Program. Um, and Physicians for the National Health Program today has more than 20,000 members. Um, and as a result of their work uh, in PNHP and with others, um, Medicare for All really um, became um, what it is today. Um, the physician's proposal published in the late 1980s, the New England Journal of Medicine, um, that was revised in JAMA in 2003, um, became the bill, H.R. 676, the Medicare for All bill, um, that was ultimately then taken on by Pramila Jayapal, and that's one of our leading pieces of legislation uh, in, 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 in the Congress today. So I think it's um, not an exaggeration to say that um, David and Steffi um, um, really are peerless in terms of um, uh, helping to make um, the fight for single payer what it is today. Um, currently, they are distinguished uh, professors at uh, City University of New York Hunter College. Um, they are also lecturers in medicine at Harvard Medical School. Um, and um, I really uh, am honored to introduce them um, to give us um, the annual health policy update. Uh, so David and Steffi, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having us. And um, can you see our screen okay? I'm never um, sure with I, Zoom. Uh, I, I see your, yep, your slide is, is front and center. Okay. Um, so we have no conflicts of interest to report. This is a, a photo of us in Canada from the days when Americans could still travel to Canada. Um, they, of course, have had done far better with the pandemic than we have. And I want to start um, by talking a little bit about why the U.S. has been so vulnerable to the COVID-19 pandemic. And um, I think it's an indicator of, of the overall weaknesses in both our health system and our society at large. Uh, and I'm not going to dwell here on the incompetence and malevolence of the current administration, but really the systemic things that preceded it. And uh, I'm going to spotlight four things, deteriorating health status of our population that set us up for the problems, weakened public health capacity, increasing inequality and a crumbling and racist social safety net, and a wasteful healthcare system that prioritizes profitability over needs. So um, 
we stopped making progress on mortality long before the COVID-19 pandemic hit since about 2012. We've really seen no improvement uh, in mortality or longevity in this nation, um, even before the pandemic. And Case and Deaton, um, in widely publicized work, identified working class whites declining economic opportunities and social status as the cause of rising mortality, but they neglected the longer standing and graver effects of economic privation and racism on indigenous and black Americans, and also uh, of the effects of our declining healthcare system. So here's some recently published data showing that the proportion of those with hypertension who have their blood pressure under control has now been falling since at least 2013. Uh, we don't have data more recent than 2018, but a major determinant of stroke, heart attack, uh, kidney failure, and all-cause mortality, um, and our healthcare system failing on this. Uh, life expectancy in the US, which was middle of the pack in 1980, has really fallen off as compared to other nations that we'd compare ourselves to. So I want you to keep in mind that 1980 year. And really until then we were middle of the pack and since then we've fallen behind. And interestingly, uh, about 1980 is when our health expenditures began to rise as well. Uh, out of keeping with those of other nations. The light blue line at the top here is the US. Well, what happened in 1980? About 1980 is when the US shifted away from the great society programs and expansions of social programs uh, and towards what's been called neoliberalism or market fundamentalism, the view that markets regulate themselves and they give everyone what they deserve, that unions distort markets, impede the formation of merit-based hierarchy, that government is incompetent, that taxes and regulation should be cut, public services should be cut or privatized, and that seeking equality is counterproductive and morally co corrosive. I've shown, um, the uh, intellectual fathers of this on the left slide and Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher who implemented on the right side here. Um, and uh, uh, Ronald Reagan, uh, sorry, this slide not showing properly, um, famously said the, the scariest words in the English language are, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. And um, Bill Clinton said the era of big government is over. So both Democrats and Republicans have really adopted neoliberal policies uh, since about 1980. Milton Friedman told us what to expect from corporations. He, sa he said, few trends could so thoroughly undermine the very foundations of our free society as the acceptance by corporate officials of a social responsibility other than to make as much money for their shareholders as possible. So weaken government and make sure that corporations don't take a, a uh, more socially responsible view. Um, well, weakened public health capacity is one reflection of this neoliberal trend. And since 2002, we've had a declining share of our uh, total health expenditures devoted to public health spending. So we're now at the outset of the COVID epidemic down to about 2.45% of total health spending in the US going for the public health measures which are so vital to fighting a pandemic. And Canada by contrast spends 6.2% of its health budget on prevention and public health. And as a result, the public health workforce declined by 20% between 2008 and 2016. So again, preceding the uh, malevolence of the Trump pandemic, we can't blame him for this. Um, and the incredible shrinking health and prevention fund, the uh, Affordable Care Act allocated $15 billion to shore up public health uh, infrastructure. And in the initial years, the promised money materialized, that's through 2012, but thereafter it's been drained as Congress and the presidents have interceded to take the promised money away. And what's happened uh, over 10 years, 
15 billion promised, as I said, but in 2012, 6 billion was cut to pay for the Medicare doc fix to uh, increase physicians payments. And in 2013, 450 million was spent to, uh, to build the federal exchanges under the Affordable Care Act and 67 million for navigators. 3.5 billion was cut as part of the 21st Century Cures Act, the FDA reform measure and uh, continuing resolutions cutting it since then. So um, Trump, of course, greatly weakened the public health capacity since then, there was a hiring freeze that left 700 positions vacant at the CDC. He abolished the global health security team of the National Security Council. More than 1,600 government scientists had left positions uh, under the Trump administration even before the pandemic, and many key science policy positions remain vacant to this day. And of course, defunding the WHO, which the Lancet characterized as a crime against humanity. Um, and the way we fund public health in this country makes no sense, much of it through grants and contracts. Uh, so the, the routine operation of a public health department depends on getting grants that they have to apply for each year or two years. Um, it's a bit like saying we'll run the army by paying soldiers based on the grants that we secure this year. So our public health infrastructure has been uh, undermined and faulty. And we've had an increasing and crumbling, any increasing inequality and a crumbling and racist safety net. So here's the a graph of the income share of the wealthiest 1% of the population. And you see that we're reaching levels not seen since the Great Depression back in 1930. The rich have been getting richer and the poor getting poorer. And that's um, partly because of, of the market and partly because of our tax policies. So we've graphed here the percent of income going to the each a portion uh, going to taxes for each portion of the population. The poorest 10% of the population is on your left. And in 1950, the poorest 10% spent 16% of their incomes for taxes. By 2018, that percentage had risen to 28%. And the richest 400 families in America, in 1950, their tax rate was 70%. By 2018, their tax rate was 23%. So our policies have reinforced inequality and life expectancy reflects that. So the change in life expectancy between 2001 and 2014 at your left is the poorest part of the population and at your right, the richest. And the richest have seen rapid growth in their life expectancy and the poorest actually a decline in life expectancy since 2001. And just to make the point that while whites and at least before the pandemic, um, Latinx people uh, did better than black and native Americans um, in terms of life expectancy, all groups in the US have shorter life expectancy than the average of the other G7 nations, the other wealthy nations that we'd compare ourselves to. And we imprison extraordinary numbers of people, not only once they're convicted, but even before people are convicted. So Iran, we might view as a repressive society or Russia, but we have far more people in detention without trial than either of those two nations. And one of the things that prepared us for this pandemic was the impossibility of social distancing in prisons. And prisons have been a seeding of this pandemic, not only among prisoners and among staff, but as those folks cycle back into the community. So the Cook County Jail was uh, responsible for 15.7% of all documented COVID-19 cases in the state of Illinois because of the cycling in and out of that prison affecting so many people throughout the society. And many outside of prisons live in homes where quarantine and isolation is impossible. So CDC says people who are exposed to the virus or have tested positive for it should be quarantined or isolated in a separate bedroom and with a separate bathroom. And while 20% of white Americans have homes that 
are conceivable to isolate in. 46% of, of Hispanics are not, and 33% of Native Americans have no such possibility, 32% of Blacks. And homeless folks, of course, uh, have no such possibilities as well. 114,000 students in New York City homeless and social distancing in homeless shelters or on the streets, almost impossible. COVID-19 has sharply reduced the life expectancy of Black and Latinx people in the US. This from the demography group at Princeton University estimating the impact of the COVID pandemic, which has reduced white life expectancy by nearly a year, Latinx by more than three years, and Black life expectancy by uh, more than two and a half years. And the causes of the excess uh, mortality in the Black community are things that we can do something about with good medical care, but only if people can get to us. And we know that both the uninsured uh, Medicaid patients and people of color have lower rates of hypertension control than well-insured and white non-Hispanic folks in this country. So only 22% of the uninsured with hypertension have their blood pressure controlled. And we know that Black and Latinx serving hospitals, hospitals with a large proportion of, of people of color as their patients have far lesser funding here as represented by the investments in their facilities, about uh, $3,000 less for black serving hospitals than for mainly white serving hospitals. And black and Latinx serving hospitals uh, have much less in the way of high tech services, things like cardiac catheterizations, so vital for patients who arrive in the throes of, of a myocardial infarction. So we discriminate against uh, minority patients and we discriminate against the possibility of minority doctors. So the AAMC set a goal that black physicians should represent the same share of the physician workforce as the uh, pop, black population. Uh, and we've never reached that goal that was set in 1976 and re remained far, far from it. Um, we know that Black patients are more likely to take the advice of Black doctors. This is a randomized trial with uh, randomizing patients to be seen by a Black physician or white physician who made identical recommendations. And the Black patients we're much more likely to follow the recommendation of the black doctor than the white doctor, although the patients said that they liked uh, both black and white doctors equally. And uh, we know that m both black, Latinx, and Native Americans are much more likely to be uninsured. Uh, we know that the number of uninsured has soared with the a COVID pandemic, though we don't know precisely the figure. This is an estimate we published in the Annals of Internal Medicine that now about 40 million are likely to be uninsured. And we an estimate that uh, is based on some work that Adam Gaffney led on the number of deaths that have likely resulted from uninsurance, about 38,000 before Trump took office each year, about 41,000 in the uh, 2019. And due to COVID uh, job losses, about 60,000 deaths from uninsurance this, this year. Uh, high deductible plans have been rising and that means that even people with coverage have grave difficulties affording care. And we know that that means delays in uh, breast cancer care for both biopsy, diagnosis, and chemotherapy, and among low, middle, and high-income populations. And we know that free medications improve compliance with, medication, with recommended medications. They lower hemoglobin A1c, blood pressure, and uh, high, hypercholesterolemia. Again, randomized controlled trial data. And in Europe, when uh, the Netherlands instituted a 200 euro copayment for routine psych visit. The result was a fall in those routine visits, but a rise in emergency visits and involuntary commitments. And what we've had as this uh, 
neoliberal strategy has played out in medicine is a sharp rise in the number of administrators, even as the number of doctors has risen only slowly. And we know that uh, insurers have profited extremely uh, handsomely from the COVID pandemic. They're paying for little care, uh, but still getting healthy revenues. So Cigna, Aetna, and United uh, now getting about 30% overhead um, from their premiums. And of course, uh, folks continuing to make extraordinary incomes, not just from insurance, but from other aspects of healthcare business. Private equity taking over a growing share of physician practices. This consulting firm saying that 60 billion dollars invested in takeovers of physician practices last year by private equity firms and pro health industry profits have been soaring and we expect will soar again this year more than a hundred billion dollars taken out of the healthcare system for investor profits and we should not excuse our nonprofit systems which both take enormous profits out of the healthcare system and then invest them in things like hedge funds and venture capital. Um, pharma spent more on rewarding shareholders than on the R&D that it claims it's uh, spending so much on. Um, and let me now turn this over to Steffi to continue from here. Um. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, uh, pharma is spending uh, more. Okay, okay. Um, thanks. We having a little trouble. We switched to a new computer uh, yesterday to get some faster uh, processing for data, and it's not working so well with PowerPoint. But thanks for hanging in there with us. Um, turns out that the taxes are funding about two thirds of total health spending. Uh, and this includes not just Medicare, Medicaid, the VA, but also the benefit costs of public workers uh, and the so-called tax subsidy to private insurance, um, which is the money lost to the federal treasury because health benefits are not taxable as income. So when you look at public funding in this way, two thirds of all funding of healthcare in the United States is in fact taxpayer funded. Uh, and that has been increasing uh, over time uh, through the ACA as more and more of total health care is tax funded. Um, the tax funded share, uh, which I've portrayed in yellow at the bottom of the slide in the United States is more than $7,600 per person per year. Uh, and then there's an additional 4,000 or so that we take out of private funds. Uh, but that $7,600 turns out to be more than total spending, public and private, on a per capita basis in every other nation on earth, with the exception of Switzerland. So, in fact, we have been um, uh, we have been paying the full price of a national health insurance plan like they have in Europe, only we haven't been getting it. Um, what have we been getting for all this extra spending? Well, we certainly haven't been getting extra life expectancy. The US is shown in yellow on this and the subsequent slides. We live four to five years shorter than people in other parts of the world. We don't get lower infant mortality. Our infant mortality is twice that in many European countries. Um, where did that come from? Um, something just skipped here. Okay, just a moment, guys. Do you see what happened? Okay. You, no. Take take your time. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. It's I, I'm sure we'll analyze that data faster, but sorry to waste everyone's time. Yeah. Okay. We're going to have to reload this. Just a moment. Okay. No worries, and just take your time. We have we have time to. Yeah, okay, oh, thank you. So let's just run it off the USB case, right? Can we? Yeah, we've had this problem in the past. If you sometimes PowerPoint's incompatible between computers, and uh, mm -hmm. we were updating this to the very last moment because we knew everyone wanted the most up to date slides. Okay. All right. Well, I'm going to jump around to this a little bit because David's going to have to reload that uh, 
that uh, presentation. But uh, we're going to talk a little see... bit about. Oh, sorry, I was going to say, we do see the slides. I don't know if, if you're aware. Okay, of that. Well, yes, but you're seeing a slide that says Medicare Advantage plans, and it was supposed to be about something else. But okay. um, I'm going to switch gears just a little bit. Sorry, it's going to be a little disorganized, but that happens sometimes. But um, I want to talk about uh, Medicare Advantage and why that's so important to understand. And Medicare Advantage, um, it's not just part of Medicare, right? But it's actually the model of how a public option would work. And because Joe Biden has says he supports a public option, it's really important to understand uh, how Medicare Advantage actually functions. And uh, Medicare Advantage has much higher overhead than the uh, public Medicare. Um, it uh, has an overhead of about 14%, whereas public Medicare has an overhead of only about 2%. Um, and yet Medicare Advantage has been able to outcompete traditional Medicare, uh, telling us something about how a public option would be able to outcompete um, would be outcompeted by private insurance, that private insurance could outcompete a public option, even if the public option had lower overhead. Um, so the Medicare Advantage plans have been able to outcompete traditional Medicare uh, through a series of mechanisms. Uh, they have used cherry picking, uh, that is uh, selectively enrolling healthier than average patients. Uh, even within diagnostic categories like asthmatics, they can selectively recruit healthier asthmatics. Um, they have used a process called lemon dropping, which is what this slide is about, uh, which is designing your benefit package and your network in order to get people who are ill to drop out of the Medicare Advantage plan. And so, Suppose you're in a Medicare Advantage plan, they've cherry picked you, they think you're healthy, but then you get cancer by charging you a 20% coinsurance for cancer chemotherapy, they can force you to drop out. And coinsurance means you pay 20% of the bill. And with cancer chemos running in the hundreds of thousands of dollars, obviously this can push people out very quickly. So cherry picking and lemon dropping, turning the public plan into a de facto high risk pool. Um, similarly, if you, join a Medicare Advantage plan or a private plan and you acquire a new disability, you're pressured to switch out of Medicare Advantage and into the public option. Um, now, Medicare Advantage plans have also been able to cheat. Uh, they claim make major claims for unsupported diagnoses. And this is actually uh, based on an audit by CMS. Um, they find that about $10 billion a year um, are uh, Medicare Advantage plans that have claimed patients have diagnoses, that there's absolutely no evidence on the chart that they have the diagnoses. And yet CMS doesn't, go, it uh, conducts these audits, but does not demand that the Medicare Advantage plans pay all this money back, allowing them to continue to profit uh, off of the public, off of the public sector. Um, they the current Medicare Advantage payment formula allows them to get big bonuses based on quality. It's the so-called star rating system. Um, and yet uh, uh, there's very little auditing that's going on. Uh, the Medicare Advantage plans claim that they have lowered readmission rates because readmission rates is an important quality metric they get paid based on. They claim that the readmission rates for CHF, MI, and pneumonia are substantially less than the readmission rates in traditional Medicare drawn as that one line across the slide. Um, and yet when, some, when private people, this is out of Brown University, went back and audited the readmission rates, it turned out that the Medicare Advantage had essentially the same readmission rates uh, as the um, as traditional Medicare. And, and those of you who work in hospitals understand why that's true. Just because a patient has Medicare Advantage, you don't do anything different than if they have Medicare. There's no way their readmission rates are really going to be lower. Um, consequently, uh, Medicare Advantage plans actually raise costs to the taxpayers, and that's not my conclusion. It's the conclusion of this major study in the American Economics Journal. Um, they suppress the amount of care that the patients get, and yet their overhead is so high, represented in yellow, that their total costs are in fact larger than the costs in traditional Medicare. Um, 
Okay. So uh, that's the problem with going with a public option. It's going to look a whole lot like a public option competing with private insurance. It's going to look a whole lot like traditional Medicare competing with um, uh, with the Medicare Advantage plans, which are private plans. Okay, let's see if we can get this to work again. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, consequently, for any level of spending, single payer is going to purchase more care and less administration than public option. And it's not speculation. That's what we know from the Medicare Advantage plan. Um, and some researchers like Allison Galvani at Yale has actually published this saying, if you're going to get to universal coverage using a single payer plan, it's going to save you a whole lot of money over using multi-payer plans like public option. Um, now I want to talk just briefly about ACOs because ACOs are structured a lot like HMOs, only they involve the hospital and health system and becoming uh, like an HMO itself, right? Um, and I would just quote Yogi Berra and say ACOs are like warmed over HMOs. It's like deja vu all over again. Um, there's been a lot of publicity about all the savings we've gotten from ACOs. Certainly if you're in a hospital, you're probably running around nonstop practically trying to get your ACO together. And there's been claims of savings every year on, as on the left. But if you factor in the bonus payments over time and that pink bar, it turns out that total savings over six years have probably been less than two thirds of a billion dollars, which, you know, in healthcare spending, that's rounding error, that is nothing. Um, so we really have been doing a lot of work on ACOs and not saving any money. And McKinsey and Company will explain to you the math of the ACO, uh, the ACO movement. Uh, you're going to, for your ACO, uh, you're going to spend nine million per year per ACO, not per ACA, nine million per year just on new data and analytics systems. You're going to spend an additional 1.25 percent of your revenue on care management. But the goal of care management, they explain, is success depends on curtailing patients' use of care and steering enrollees to low price providers, not managing chronic conditions, not as advertised. And then there's additional costs for the executive director, the head of real estate, the head of care management, lawyers, actuaries, et cetera. You know, you're going, well, what about managing chronic conditions? What about all that hot spotting, all that Camden model? Well, when people subjected the Camden model of intensive management of chronic conditions to a randomized control trial, um, it didn't work. Okay, that was just a pile of baloney, frankly. ACOs make their money by constraining care and buying lower price care. They do not make money by managing chronic conditions better. Um, now, I want to point out that Medicare, as it exists, even traditional Medicare, is not perfect. It needs improvement. Lots of financial problems uh, that seriously ill Medicare patients face uh, due to the holes in Medicare. Okay. Okay, guys. Um, all right, uh, now just a reminder about what National Health Program is in Canada. There's universal coverage. It doesn't impede. Uh, reasonable access, and that has meant no co-payments, no de deductibles. It's portable from province to province, from place to place. There's coverage for all medically necessary services, essentially all hospital care and all doctor care, and a publicly administered nonprofit program. Um, and uh, this slide is from a study about what happened in Quebec before and after the National Health Program, and uh, the the bottom line is that they switched care from low value services to higher value services as represented by a higher share of serious symptoms being seen by physicians. So you don't get a huge increase in utilization. What you get is a shift from low value care to high value care. Um, they also saw a dramatic fall in infant mortality in Canada uh, with implementation of national health program. Uh, they also saw life expectancy uh, at age 50 improve for all income groups, for all income quintiles, life expectancy over 30 years increased dramatically. We did not see that over the same time frame in the United States. The bottom two quintiles actually saw a decrease in their life expectancy at age 50 uh, over the last three decades. So Canada has been much more successful in terms of improving population health than the US system. Um, 
Canadian physicians' incomes have been just fine. Uh, I'm not going to spend much time on this, but they have not had to soak the physicians in order to make the healthcare system work. Uh, and they have indeed been much more successful in controlling costs than we have been in the United States. Uh, a big chunk of that is the extremely high insurance overhead of the private insurance industry in the United States, here shown on a per capita basis. Uh, the hospital billing and administration is much higher in the United States in Canada, those huge billing departments at all our hospitals, uh, all that time that we as clinicians spend uh, dealing with billing issues if we're trying to practice in a hospital. Uh, and then there's this, there's 190,000 members of the American Association of Professional Coders who do nothing but look at the diagnostic coding that we do and then recode it, right? the 190,000 at least of them. Uh, and then in physicians' offices, the same kind of wasteful billing related expense, about $400 excess per capita in a US physician's office versus a Canadian physician's office. And I get advertisements like this all the time that I'm supposed to hire some consulting firm to help me jack up the billings in, in, in my private practice. Uh, I don't have a private practice anymore, but I still get these advertisements. Um, so overall, the administrative cost per capita in the United States tower above those in Canada, as we argued in our paper earlier this year in the Annals of Internal Medicine, which has a lot of this detail. Um, so what we need is national insurance, national health insurance that covers everyone that's comprehensive, a single public payer with simplified reimbursement. We need to get rid of investor owned HMOs, hospitals, etc. We need to improve health planning so that the resources and capital goes where it's needed and not duplicated where it's redundant or wasteful. And then we need to be publicly accountable for quality and cost, but that's not the same thing as bureaucratizing the system, right? That's not the same thing. Um, this is some work from Chris Kai and Jim Kahn looking at all the uh, financial projections of the costs of single payer reforms, a complicated slide, but the summary is for all these different cost projections, they usually uh, uniformly project some increase in utilization, which of course we want, because there are many people who are not getting the care they get. They're relatively modest, but there are increases in utilization. And that's the red bars at the top. These are counterbalanced by decreases in costs, mostly administrative costs, the green bars going down at the bottom. And the net cost is presented in that blue line, showing that ma the majority of folks who have projected the cost of single payer do project there'd be savings. I want to look at three of the most famous projections and what they, in more recent projections, and what they are projecting about physician care. Now, there are about 1 million US physicians, and the three. Uh, Three projections I'm looking at are by the Mercatus Institute, which was funded by the Koch brothers, by the Rand Corporation, which people know, and by the Urban Institute. And um, that in all the projections, they obviously say the current system would cost $668 billion, about $700,000 per physician and total uh, physician payments and uh, practice costs, right? Um, the Mercatus Institute says that under single payer, you would slightly increase the amount going to physicians. Rand says pretty much the same. Only the Urban Institute ended up projecting that there would be a huge increase. And that projection uh, was based on the idea that there would be this huge increase and uh, you know that, that it was gonna bankrupt the country to go to single payer. Uh, but I don't really think that increase is gonna happen. Uh, but I'm just showing that the Rand and Mercatus, like most of the other projections, say there's not going to be a big change in the amount of money spent for physician care. We're going to be doing less administration, more patient care. Um, the situation in the United States is really analogous to what Charles Dickens described in his uh, 1898 Christmas story called Six Poor Travelers. And it was about a hostel that was set up as a charity to take care of six poor travelers that meant homeless people. Uh, but then the bureaucrats took over and, he, and the uh, narrator goes to visit this charitable institution. And I found too, that about a 30th part of the annual revenue was now expended on the purposes 
commemorated in the inscription over the door, the rest being handsomely laid out in chancery, law expensive, collectorship, receivership, poundage, and other appendages of management, highly complementary to the importance of the six travelers. So we've really gone to a society with a, a healthcare system where money making, finance, and administration has taken over. Nonetheless, the public still fully endorses the idea of Medicare for all. A little bit difficult slide, but uh, the blue, blue dots are supposed to be compared to the orange dots. The blue dots are the folks in the poll who said they supported Medicare for all, the orange dots people who opposed it. And you can see that really much, pretty much continuously since uh, November 20. 15, a, a majority of the American people have supported the idea of Medicare for all. So I'm going to stop now and uh, take questions. And I do want to apologize for, uh, for the uh, problems with the slides. We'll make the rest of them available to you. Um, thank you very much, um, David and Steffi, for um, what what we are used to as an incredibly um, informative um, presentation. Um, so we have some questions coming in that I've been sort of um, uh, keeping tabs on. So I'll just get started with a couple of them. Um, one of them um, that I wanted to mention, um, one of the things you've heard more and more in the healthcare reform debate in the last two years is this notion of there being um, universal healthcare of different varieties and that European countries like Germany and Switzerland um, managed to sort of achieve universalism uh, with, um, with private insurance. Can you speak a little bit about um, how that is or is not applicable and the ramifications of those examples for the US healthcare reform debate? Yeah, well, you know, the insurance in Europe is not really private. I mean, they use the word private, but really the insurance companies are much more like we would consider a fiscal intermediary for Medicare. They administer these programs but within very tight constraints that are set by government, like all of the insurance companies have to pay the same prices to a hospital. They all have to pay the same fees to physicians. They all have to charge their uh, members the same premiums. So that's not private insurance like we know in the United States. It's really just letting some private administrators uh, in between your highly regulated universal insurance and actually paying for care. Yeah, in Germany, for instance, the insurers are actually jointly managed by unions and, and uh, employers and are all uh, nonprofits. So in, in fact, moving to a German style system would antagonize our insurance industry every bit as much as, as uh, moving to single payer. It would wipe out for-profit insurers and would change their boards of directors from their current um, uh, personages to uh, labor and employer 50-50 split. Um, thank you. Um, so we've got another question here that I wanted to um, give to you. Uh, I'll, I'll just rephrase it a little bit, but you know, how would you, um, can you speak a little bit about um, the sort of, and you, you, I think it was Steffi, you presented some slides, or maybe it was David, on um, increasing um, corporate takeover of physician practices or sort of private equity coming in. Um, can you speak a little bit more about, um, I guess, um, A, um, you know, the, why that matters? Um, it sounds bad, but why it actually matters and uh, B, what we, what we can do about it, um, what we can do about it. Well, private equity comes in because they think they can increase the profitability. So the first thing they do uh, is they increase uh, the prices and uh, they demand higher prices. Um, so uh, a lot of the surprise bills that you're seeing are because private equity took over ED staffing so that emergency doctors work for private equity and the private equity company comes in and says, um, we're not making a deal with the emergency room. We're gonna be, we're gonna be out of network and charge out of network prices. Um, they often will come in and pressure doctors to do things that are profitable. So when private equity takes over a dermatology practice, they pressure the dermatologist to do more cosmetic work and less disease-oriented dermatology. So the goal of private equity is to make profits as quickly as possible and then pull the equity out. And uh, they're happy to use physicians to that end, but it's not in the patient's interest. And, you know, however much it may be the interest of physicians short term, it's certainly not in physicians long term interests either.
Very good. And um, I, I guess the one thing, um, I, I guess one thing I wanted to add to that might be um, the fact that, um, I mean, I think that both single payer, well, the, the physician's proposal that, that, that uh, PNHP um, has um, had out there for some time sort of does explicitly um, call for um, a buyout sort of of for-profit institutions. And I guess an argument could be said that there, there would really be nothing of that um, in any kind of reform that fell short of single payer. We would probably see inc uh, further trends towards increasing corporatization. Yeah, and I think the, the question about what could be done about it, really the only thing I think that can be done about it is uh, single payer with a ban on for-profit ownership. Mm -hmm. And I guess an, another somewhat related question, um, you, you spoke a little bit about kind of how physicians would fare under single payer. And, you know, it looks like um, Canadian doctors do quite well, so it's really not uh, much of an issue of concern. Um, but I wonder a little bit, you know, what, what are the kind of scare stories that you see in the media um, that, that actually is sort of repeated a lot uh, is this idea that, um, you know, hospitals will go under if you pay Medicare rates, um, you know, that there's already hospital closures in rural areas, that this would sort of exacerbate um, those trends towards closures. Um, and and, and he, can you speak to that issue a little bit? Yeah, we've actually been working with a medical student at, at NYU to analyze the impact of single payer on uh, rural hospitals, particularly and critical access hospitals. And uh, virtually all of them would be better off under single payer than under current arrangements. Essentially, you global budget hospitals and pay them what they need to, to stay in operation rather than then depending on how much they can bill for patients who happen to show up. And if uninsured patients show up, they get nothing. If Medicaid patients show up, they get less than their cost of operating. So for uh, hospitals that are in trouble, a single payer with global budgets um, that negotiate uh, uh, reasonable global budget actually is, is a godsend, not a problem. So when you hear the projections that Medicare rates would be problematic, um, we've not advocated paying hospitals like Medicare does, which is per patient and based on diagnoses. We've ad advocated taking up the Canadian style global budgeting approach where you see what does it cost to operate this hospital for the year? Let's give them a check for, pay them a check for one twelfth of that each month. Um. So another question um, that I'm going to um, ask you. Um, so, sorry, I'm just having having luck here. Um, I, I guess can you speak a little bit? So you you spoke a lot about um, some of the racial health inequalities that that are sort of pervasive today. Um, are there way? Um, how does how would how could um, um, single payer sort of reform, um, ameliorate or address some of those disparities. Um, are there are ways in which it would fall short. Um, can you speak a little more to that issue? Yeah. Well, the, the, the main thing single payer can do in and of itself is equalize financial access. Make everybody who came into the hospital, everyone who came into your office, bring equal financial reward, right? And that would go a fair ways toward improving access to hospital care, improving access to physician care for minorities relative to um, the non-minority population. Um, you, you need additional reforms too, because you need to be training minority health professionals as I think David was showing some data that, you know, people like trust people from their own cultural background more, you know, and uh, they are understood better. So you do need to be training minority professionals. You need to be assuring that minority serving hospitals are getting the same level of funding as white serving hospitals uh, and that resources are put in place where they're needed and, and not uh, put in place where they're unneeded and redundant. And single payer actually provides a mechanism for that though it doesn't assure it. So by separating operating and capital payments, so we say, Let's in the global budget for hospitals, that covers the care of their patients and they have to spend it on their patients. But if they wanna build a new building or buy a new machine, they apply for a separate capital um, payment. And there we need to direct those funds to underserved communities, to, to particularly black and Latinx communities that at this point don't have adequate facilities. So 
uh, that separation of operating and capital payments creates a mechanism and we need to, to fight racism in its distribution um, to uh, write basically a form of medical reparations, if I may say. This um, is another issue that comes up frequently. Um, I, you know, I think it was earlier this year, um, Vox had a um, series where they kind of honed in on a different country. And we talked a little bit about Europe already um, and sort of lessons for the United States. And one of them was not another country, it was Maryland. And the article sort of made a case, um, oh, is this something close to home that could sort of serve as an example? So really the question is, that's just a little bit of an um, um, overview. The question is to sort of, can you comment a little bit on Maryland's all payer system? Um, what, you know, what, is there something there that, 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 that should be inter of interest to us? Well, people have called the Maryland system a globally budgeted system. It, it's not globally budgeted in the sense that that we would we would understand. So, hospitals budgets total total billings are limited, but they continue to bill patient by patient and aspirin tablet by aspirin tablet. So, there have been no administrative savings in Maryland. They've limited the increases in hospital payments, um, but the the balance between clinical uh, costs and management and administrative costs, if anything, has gone further towards administration in Maryland than in other places. So you don't get the administrative savings that are so important to fund um, covering the uninsured and up upgrading coverage for the rest of the American people. Yes, it's, it, it, it always has struck me as, as an odd um, example, just given that basically every problem in American healthcare you know, uninsurance, underinsurance, patients being, you know, sued by hospitals is, um, you know, racist sort of um, distribution of facilities and so on is sort of all replicated in that state. So, um, yeah, not to pick on Johns Hopkins, but it became famous because um, it, it sued enormous numbers of patients for unpaid bills. And it turned out the employer of the largest number of patients whom it sued was the Johns Hopkins health system. So it, it paid its workers so poorly and it insured them so poorly that um, it was suing them for their unpaid out-of-pocket uh, expenditures. Um, here's a question a little bit maybe more about um, going back to sort of the physician aspect. Um, putting aside the fact that, you know, physicians do well in Canada, um, what is the sort of uh, what sorts of improvements could we see in physicians' actual work? What we could, what, what could we envision in terms of ramifications for the physician workforce for the types of specialists um, that we that we train um, and just sort of for doctors' day to day lives? Is there anything you can comment on that? Well, the, the immediate effect would be to reduce the administrative hassles of medicine because there would be a simple binding fee schedule and. Uh, it's very, it would be very easy to bill. In fact, it is extremely easy to bill in Canada. They don't actually have uh, billing clerks and employees who send bills. Often there's one person working half a day a month um, helping them send bills. Um, so that would be the big change. And then other changes would, you know, would be matters of policy decisions. And personally, I think we need to be training more primary care doctors and somewhat fewer specialists, but uh, that's a separate policy decision. And we pay for virtually all residency training through Medicare. So we have the levers to actually say to, to hospitals, we, we don't need more specialists. We do need more primary care doctors. Um, but we haven't exercised that. We'd need to, to do that under any system. And frankly, we ought to, to change the balance in, um, in reimbursement so that specialist incomes uh, are not many fold higher than primary care doctors. Okay, I'm going to close out with maybe um, uh, one very wonky policy question that I'm, I'm kind of curious to hear your answer to. Uh, one other policy question, and then we'll, maybe we'll round it up with sort of a, a, a political question. Um, so the, the wonky uh, question is um, that your capital budget proposal sounds much like um, a maligned and manipulated certificates of need. Um, so I'd be curious to hear your thought on that. The, and, and the second policy question is um, uh, it's about access to undocumented immigrants or immigrants more broadly. How should we be speaking of that issue? What would single payer do? So let me, 
Okay, I'll take the immigrant one, because in a way I think it's more important. I mean, PNHP has always proposed that everyone who actually lives in the United States, who resides in the United States, whether they have papers or not, should be eligible for care. That's eminently affordable. It's been done in a lot of European countries. It's not a major financial problem, but it does create a much more fair system. Um, we should also say that immigrants actually subsidize the care of, uh, of non-immigrants. And a series of studies by uh, our now late colleague, tragically died last week, uh, Leah Zalman, uh, who showed that uh, both in private insurance and Medicare, um, immigrants pay into the system substantially more than, than they take out. And the uncompensated care costs for immigrants have been trivial. So uh, not only as a human rights ma measure, but as a measure of, of fairness, um, immigrants ought to be covered and ought to be, be full participants. Uh, on the matter of, of um, certificate of need, so the certificate of need programs were programs were uh, in order to make a major investment, hospitals or other facilities had to get permission from a state agency. Um, and two things about that, one is, uh, it actually studies show did improve the rationality of investments. So it limited the duplication of facilities and that duplication actually worsened the quality of care. So it limited the, the number of, for instance, of hospitals that were doing open heart surgery. And we know that um, that duplication led to lower quality because many hospitals were doing too few procedures to be good at it, and therefore their uh, complication and mortality rates were higher. So the evidence is that certificate of need did actually improve quality. Um, but beyond that, the problem with certificate of need is that th they only approved funding, uh, approved buildings when hospitals said, we have the funds in hand to do this. Um, and the certificate of need agency was not the funder, they were just the approver. And that was a very weak way of allocating funds. What it meant is that only profitable hospitals could actually even come to the certificate of need agency and ask for those, uh, for those investments. So we need a, a much stronger planning mechanism than certificate of need. And that's why we've proposed under single payer that the single payer have a capital fund that it, it offers to hospitals to say, come to us with what you'd like to do and we'll allocate those funds based on need. And that's essentially what's been done in Canada and it's why there's a much more rational distribution of resources there. And I apologize, I see there's 111 questions out there. Um, so I don't know how we're gonna get those answered. We, there is also a longer version of this that is uh, available for you to look at. And uh, I really appreciate everybody's questions and, and attention. And it includes about uh, 20 slides that somehow got <laughs> axed out of this version. And those, those who wanna contact us with questions directly are, are welcome to email us. We'll try and respond. Himmelhandler at Comcast.net is our home email. H-I-M-M-E-L-H-A-N-D-L-E-R at Comcast.net. Um, well, thank you, David. I'm going to, can we just close with one last question that I think is important? Um, any thoughts as a close, as a closing, um, um, to close things out, should we be talking about even going further beyond what we've proposed? Um, is a national health service or certain aspects of a national health service something that we should begin to explore and discuss? Well, I think the uh, a National Health Service would be a situation in which there's actual public ownership of the hospitals and employing the doctors, like a VA type model, that would be National Health Service, whereas a Canadian type model or Medicare for all is more what we call national health insurance. Um, I think in some circumstances, National Health Service would be appropriate. There are some parts of the country where there is only one health system that you have to go to. There's only one, you know, one place for you to go, uh, one tertiary care hospital, one set of doctors. And it really does not make sense for that to be privately owned because they have too much market power. There's no way that's a market situation. So in that circumstance, it might make sense to go to a straight national health service model. Most of the rest of the country, probably not in my opinion, but. I'll disagree with Steffi on that and say, I think that the, 
the, uh, the evidence is that the Veterans Administration provides superior care to the rest of our health system uh, and is more economical, um, and that uh, moving to a VA-style model for the nation as a whole would upgrade quality and increase efficiency. And I think uh, while there are many parts of the country that are not yet owned and operated by a single uh, single uh, health system, increasing shares of our of our healthcare are in fact being owned and operated by a few giant corporations. I mean, even in New York and Boston, we really only have uh, a few oligopolies that control the system and having them uh, in private hands with private decision making and without democratic input, uh, I think doesn't make much sense. You know, the Scottish say, instead of viewing patients as consumers, they want uh, patients to view the health system as the owners of the healthcare system. And I think the only way to make patients really the owners of the healthcare system is a national health service where they formally own and exercise that ownership. So to my mind, um, a single payer is, is a minimal demand. Um, and if we really wanna do something better, I would move to a national health service, but uh, this is a family dispute. <laughs> All right, a little ideological rift. Um, well, um, again, thank you, David and Steffi, so much for your perspectives. That was a really interesting talk. Um, and um, the poll is jumping up, so you can thank our speaker in three ways. Um, what we're going to do is um, take a break. Um, remember, please uh, feel free to um, post on social media. The hashtag is PNHP2020. And um, we'll be getting started again. I'll see you at the next um, session at 1.30 Eastern. Um, so everyone have a, um, see you again and thanks again, Dave and Steffi.